can I can I do one last? Yeah. Just start start in presentation mode, and then it will. Then right, right, right. Yeah. Oh, brilliant! That works perfectly. Okay. Uh, so um, let me start the recording, and then I'll ding, and then I'll just give a really brief intro. One second. So, hey, everybody, I'd love to introduce Mark Taylor from San Diego National Labs, who is going to talk about the computational challenges of, well, modeling the climate of the whole damn world. You know, welcome, Mark. Yeah, so yeah, you can start. That's the intro. Uh -huh. Mark, can you hear me? Yes. I, sorry, okay. it was breaking up. Ah, breaking I see. Up. Yeah, go for it. Okay, go ahead and start. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I'll talk about our work developing a cloud resolving model and targeting these exascale computers. Um, I have a lot of slide, a lot of contributions from, I've listed some key contributors, um, but in most of my slides, I've tried to put references when necessary. But I've surely forgotten some people, and apologies for that. Um, but it's a big team effort. Um, a quick outline, I just have a few slides on an overview of our project that funds this work called E3SM, Exascale Energy Earth System Model. Uh, most of my time I'll spend talking about SCREAM, that's our new atmosphere model, stands for Simple Cloud Resolving E3SM Atmosphere Model. Um, we are tar targeting cloud resolving resolutions, with, which makes it especially expensive, um, and our goal is to run on the these new exascale computers that the Department of Energy is building. It's a, one of our main missions. Um, I talk mostly about porting Scream to these exascale systems um, and show some performance results. And then I just had a comment on machine learning and GCRMs and digital twins at the end. Um, uh, so e E3SM is a uh, uh, about 100, uh, 50 FTEs spread over 100 staff and eight different uh, uh, DOE laboratories and uh, several universities uh, uh, contractors. Um, uh, classic uh, Earth system model with atmosphere, land, ocean, and ice components. Um, we have a science mission um, that comes from DOE looking at energy and water issues out 40 years and a, uh, our key computational goal, which is of uh, my involvement, um, or my main work, is to ensure E3SM will run well on these upcoming exascale computers. Our project is on GitHub. Uh, most climate models these days are, are open source, meaning the release the code for the releases. We're one of the first to go to what we call open development, meaning the whole thing is on GitHub, all the PRs and, and everything is uh, done publicly. Um, and we have a reasonable website, e3sm.org. A timeline of the E3SM project in the starting around the 1990s, actually with the, with the par rise of parallel computers, that's how DOE got into, um, started working with the community Earth system model. It was called, uh, called something different at that time, but with NCAR. So for quite a while, over 10 years, the DOE labs worked with NCAR through about 2015 on the CESM. Um, and I think probably many in the audience are familiar with CESM. 2015, DOE reorganized uh, all their modeling development projects into this one larger project, E3SM. Um, motivation by uh, uh, really focusing model developments on particular science questions from from DOE Office of Science, and to ensure the model will run well on these exascale computers. 2000, so, the, and we started with CESM version 1.2, since many of the energy lab system had been working on that model for a long time. Our first release, so our V0 is CESM version 1.2. Uh, 2018 was a, our first release, um, which already diverged somewhat from CESM. Um, in particular, we adopted the spectral element dynamical core in the atmosphere um, and the MPAS uh, uh, components for ocean and ice. And then our V2 release was in 2021, and our V3 releases should be uh, next year. Um, just to uh, 
go through the components briefly. Um, we follow the CESM coupling structure. So they have now five components, um, all running in a single executable, but uh, each individually talking through the flux coupler, which maps the fluxes and state variables between the different models and controls the execution. Um, so I already mentioned MPAS models for uh, sea ice, land ice, and ocean, uh, the ELM land model. And most of my uh, talk will be on the EAM XX atmosphere model. EAM refers to the Fortran code, EAM XX, the rewriting it in C++. Um, I probably don't need to show this video, um, but I will anyway. This is from our V1 release. Um, uh, I like to show this just for people not in the climate modeling field to convey that the climate models really look like weather forecast models. And I think non uh, people outside our field have a more intuitive understanding of a weather forecast model. So this is just showing that that was ocean currents. Um, and then it, it slows down, the, the video slows down quite a bit to show the atmosphere on top of the ocean. So the ocean currents are still moving in this video, just much slower than the atmosphere. And this is a kind of the bare minimum in the atmosphere resolution to get tropical cyclones. And you can see some tropical cyclones and they, they make a nice cool, uh, they stir up the ocean and leave a cold wake, a streak of yellow, you know, stirring up the surface layer of the ocean behind them in their tracks. So. E3SM, you know, I like to tell people think of it as a weather forecast model, but we don't bother with complicated initial conditions or three-day forecasts, but we have to run that for um, tens, if not hundreds of years in individual simulations. It makes it quite expensive and is then typically run at lower resolutions than a forecast model. So. Jumping into the atmosphere component, um, and this is true of all modern global atmosphere models for many years now. It may start to change in the future, but ha hasn't quite yet, at least in kind of production models. It's divided into two components, the dynamical core, di-core, solves the uh, equations of motion. We're using the non-hydrostatic non equations with the shallow atmosphere approximation. Uh, and then a uh, in addition to that linear transport of about 40 uh, species. In the cloud resolving model I'm talking about, we have 10 species because we don't, we have a prescribed, we're using prescribed aerosols, so we don't have to transport aerosol species. And the dynamical core contains all the MPI communication and then it is the, you know, all the scalability issues come from the dynamical core. And then that's coupled to an extensive suite of subgrid physical parameterizations for all the unresolved effects, precipitation, radiative heating, um, phase change, uh, things like that, uh, often referred to as column physics because the individual columns, and I, I don't know if my cursor shows up, probably not, but this orange, there's an orange column here indicating the column physics. The, the columns don't talk to each other. Yeah, and we can see your mouse. Okay, oh, very good. Um, so the dynamical core is what sets your grid and your numerical methods. Um, until recently, most global atmosphere models were all based on traditional latitude longitude grids, either finite difference, finite volume, or um, spherical harmonics. Um, but most modeling centers starting in the 2000s have been transitioning into unstructured grids. That's to get rid of this. The lat long grid has this pole problem all the the resolution really clusters there, just creates some uh, mostly problems for parallel computers. Um, and so we're in in E3SM, we're using the spectral element method, and that requires that's a finite element method that requires quadrilater quadrilateral elements. Uh, so the cube sphere grid shown here uh, is the natural choice for us, which is what we're using. It's an inscribed cube, and it's further subdivided into quads. Um, Actually, question: yeah. uh, Is that choice based because you you want to use GPUs and similarly like structure architecture where you want cubes? So originally, the choice was made for spectral elements. Was uh, there? Are, 
when going to these unstructured grids, there's a lot of numerical challenges, getting good accuracy when you move away, when you're, at, when you're on a less structured grid. And spectral element method um, preserves, it's one of the few methods that's explicit, unlike most finite element methods, and preserves its uh, order of accuracy, even in these unstructured meshes. Um, finite volume methods often lose of order of accuracy on these types of methods. Uh, since that time, I mean, this was developed in parallel. There's been a lot of good finite element methods, to, especially on, I, on this, really the dual grid of the icosahedral grid, so the TRISC scheme in particular, that addresses many of those issues as well. So it was really, that was our motivation, but then we were fortunate in that the spectral element method is this, everything is this tensor product structured calculation, unlike the finite element approaches, which happen to map very well on GPUs. So I'd say that wasn't a, I'd like to say it was an intentional choice, but it was more of a, a Got it. lucky coincidence. Right. Or maybe you could say that since we were targeting GPUs, um, we stuck with the spectral element approach as opposed to a, a Abandon it, yeah. to, to, to switching to something else. Um, oh, nice. Yep. Thank you. Um, and then just to so once you go unstructured, then you have this ability to do um, regionally refined meshes or local refinement, um, and that's been quite popular in the last couple of years. Uh, it's really been a useful capability where you can statically refine over a region of interest. Um, no production or, or operational models that I know of use adaptive refinement yet. That's still a challenge, but uh, I, you know, I know it's, it works very well in other applications, but for this application, that's still a challenge. But static refinement has been uh, uh, very uh, useful. Okay, so then uh, uh, just a slide showing resolution where the typical E3SM simulations run. Um, this is a slide showing topography uh, over California, centered over the Bay Area, with a, a 200 kilometer resolution here, so relatively large squares, 25 kilometers, one kilometer. Most E3SM simulations and IPCC class uh, climate change assessment simulations are still run at 100 kilometers, somewhere in between here, although there's a few at 50 and 25 kilometers. And at cloud resolving, we're really targeting one kilometer, um, which is shown here. Um, but all the work I'm going to show, that's still quite expensive, is at 3.25 kilometers. Um, and I'm going to refer to that as cloud resolving, if you can get to this resolution in your global atmosphere model, although many people might object. That, and some people will call that cloud permitting or storm, storm resolving resolution. Uh, this figure interestingly enough, was taken from the Green Flash project back in 2009. That was the project to run cloud, a cloud resolving model, to, to build a dedicated machine to run a cloud resolving model at one kilometer. And they were going to use uh, ARM-based chips. Um, so an interesting project, but I don't think they ever got the funding to actually build the massive machine that would have been needed. And when you say it's cloud resolving, you mean that you don't need a, a subscale model, the, the regular atmospheric differential equations just make clouds. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I'm not going to, so from my point of view, so I'm sort of simplistically saying get to three kilometers, we're going to call it a cloud res resolving model. But you're right, there's a very good motive, uh, you know, scientific motivation to get to these scales. Um, and it's exactly what you're saying is removing the convective parameterization. So I do have one, I at least mention that, <laughs> mention that bullet in this slide. Um, so cloud resolving simulations with, here it says grid spacing less than three kilometers, although we're, we're at 3.25 kilometers, um, really one kilometer, but three kilometers you're getting close and you can, you can start turning off this convective parameterization. So that's the cloud resolving refers to, you know, not resolving individual clouds, but resolving the overturning circulations responsible for cloud formation. Um, and at lower resolutions, they have to be parameterized. And it's uh, commonly blamed as one of the largest sources of uncertainty in climate models and climate projections. So it's a, a 
you know, big push to get to cloud resolving models to remove this parameterization. You still have, you know, a host of others. Um, and you can run, of course, cloud regional cloud resolving models and short global cloud resolving models right now. So we know they do work well. Um, re re resolved convection does substantially reduce ma major systematic errors in precipitation because of its, you know, explicit treatment of convective storms. Um, and so then we believe it will, uh, I have here, improve our ability to assess regional impacts of climate change. Um, this was just a, an animation from, a, a, again, a, over, over California of an atmospheric river in, a, in our 3.25 kilometer cloud resolving model. Oops. Oh, so, so SCREAM, that's our cloud resolving model. This is just a high level overview of the components in it. The dynamical core, um, the resolved scale fluid dynamics is a spectral element method that I mentioned briefly. For radiation, um, we use a C++ port of the RRTMGP package. Microphysics is a, is a P3 schemes and then aerosols are uh, prescribed in our at least our initial versions of the model and then the parameterized convection you know we don't have that parameterization and that's the these two are responsible for the simple in the scream it's sim simpler <laughs> because it doesn't have prescribed aerosol and no convection um, and running of these resolutions is uh, uh, has a lot of benefits the one I'd like is it's really uh, striking how real the simulations look and you can now compare simulations directly to satellite observations so this in the middle is a is a simul is a is a scream simulation um, plotting shortwave sh uh, shortwave cloud forcing and then zoomed in is, uh, directly compared to satellite images this is a diamond simulation so that's a, a cloud resolving air comparison model project that provides initial conditions. So we run this initial, con it's from January 20, 20, 2020, can run this initial condition and compare with observations at least for a couple of days, which is what we're doing here. After, this is after two days. And then just one, one more example of something cloud resolving models uh, do a good job at. Uh, on the climate side, it's the diurnal cycle of precipitation. So this is not how uh, when not how much rain you get but uh, when do, when do you get most of the rain so this is a, a difficult to get in models with parameterized convection difficult to get it right in cloud resolving models but they do do a better job at these kind of statistics okay now i'm going to uh, switch to exascale computing um and returning back to this resolution, just some, some numbers here, our 100 kilometer traditional simulations, they run at six, the atmosphere component runs at 64 simulated years per day on 85 CPU nodes. But our cloud resolving simulation is one simulated year, so you know, 60 times slower. It requires 32,000 GPUs just to achieve that rate. So there, these global cloud resolving models are incredibly expensive and they're typically run on the world's largest computers. And in the US, those are these new exascale machines. Uh, the Department of Energy has been leading the US effort to develop the first exascale machines. Um, and that's shown on this roadmap here. Uh, uh, and this is up at the top is related to E3SM development. Um, so this is kind of the machines we have access to and the machines we're targeting. And the exascale machines, especially for Scream. So the uh, first exascale system to be delivered was Frontier just early this year. And the next one will be Aurora uh, at Argonne and Frontiers at Oak Ridge uh, later this year or early next year. Sorry, I'm gonna close that pop-up window. And then within our lab system, the other machine we run on is called uh, Perlmutter. And here are just a description of these uh, machines and what they have. But the key point for our point of view is they're all GPU based. Uh, that wasn't clear when the project started that, that the US X scale machines would be GPU based, but basically all the horsepower in these machines from something like 90, 
8% comes from GPUs. So our exascale strategy has been uh, evolved into it running the model on GPUs. Um, and really within DOE, that's the only only cycles that will be available in the, in the near future. So a uh, question on this. Um, it does, did, I mean, I'm thinking of some of the older architectures like what the cell processors back in the day of what the Roadrunner and the uh, Blue Gene, which are a bunch of dumb processors, but a lot of them, uh, GPUs are a very specific kind of architecture. So why is it really where the industry is going uniformly because this is just what everybody's doing? Or are there, if you had to make a new processor just for climate or something, or some more focused uh, numerical workloads, is I GPU your preferred architecture, or would you want a better, more focused thing? So I would say it's not our preferred architecture. If we could build a machine for climate, it wouldn't be, probably wouldn't be GPUs. Um, so it's a little bit of, it, you know, the exascale machines, that mean run, running an exaflop on the Linpack benchmark, at, but they support many different applications. So in some sense, they're building these machines to get to an exaflop, and some machine, some applications run great. Other applications run run pretty well. You know, climate. There, I think there we get a slight benefit over CPUs, but not like factors of ten. I have some data on that later on. So they are good, um, but it's a lot of work to port your code to running on them. So and then, what's for climate? What do you uh, need? Like, would it be more like a CPU, more of a flexible architecture, or more of a constraint, oh, we, but different constraints architecture? Yeah, you mean if we could build our own machine and design our own chip? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, the, so the best results, so it, it, so GPUs actually can outperform them, but the, for very little work, we get really excellent results on modern, like Epics and these new uh, Intel uh, Cascade Lake CPUs. If I, if I had even more control, the, you, you know, you, you could, uh, for climate, drop the cache coherency on those chips. So build a chip like that with and get rid of all that circuitry devoted to cache coherency because we run MPI and don't, you know, don't need the shared memory uh, protection that you need for that. Um, and so that would either lower the power or let you put, you know, more, more floating point units on it. That's cool. just, yeah. you know, un, only mildly informed speculation, though. I don't know that it, that you could build such. A, oh, yeah, though, no, just like what, what there is actually a good answer for, for this. Uh, and Michael, you had a question. Uh, yes, my question is uh, like um, following on your uh, question. So I see that you have like two CPUs there, six GPUs per node. Uh, do you run something on both CPUs and GPUs at the same time? Uh, like, uh, and if so, what is the desirable mix? Yeah, so our our initial target, and we're not at the state, we're running atmosphere only simulations right now or atmosphere land, um, but we leave the land on the CPU because it's very, it doesn't take, it's, it's like less than 2% of the total cost. And even the ocean, it kind of depends on the resolution, but a very good use case will be cloud resolving atmosphere, eddy resolving ocean. So the cloud resolving atmosphere runs completely on the GPUs and it only needs a few CPU cores to manage that onto the kernels. And then the rest of the CPU cores, we will run the ocean model, our you know traditional Fortran version if we want. Uh, but we're also you know eventually porting the ocean model to GPUs as well. So yes, yeah, so that's a good, uh, these mixed architectures are useful for us for that reason. It's very problem dependent. If you want to run high res ocean driven by a low res atmosphere, then you then you need the ocean on the GPU, of course. And you can imagine all the different scenarios. Okay. So our strategy to um, run on GPUs has been uh, we basically spent a lot of time trying to get Fortran with OpenACC and even a little work on OpenMP to work, and it was uh, mostly just frustration. Um, and we uh, switched to a C++ strategy. We decided to rewrite the code in C++, um, and then we use, a, for the execution model, a, a 
uh, library, Cocos or Yak, I'll say a little bit about that just to hide the different GPU or CPU uh, execution statements. Um, so you're right. Um, and this has been a very robust and well-supported solution. It lets us get on the machines very early. Uh, the vendors always have good C++ support and Fortran is very lagging. I think the Fortran support will eventually catch up. Uh, so I don't think it's a bad choice to go with Fortran, to stick with Fortran um, and wait for OpenACC. OpenACC is getting there on NVIDIA, but has a long way to go on AMD GPUs. And OpenMP, in our experience, still very immature. Um, so that's, uh, we went with the C++ approach due to frustration with, with Fortran maturity and vendor support mostly. But yeah, all um, almost all codes are uh, atmosphere and climate models and weather prediction models are still written in Fortran. That's starting to change. I have a slide. I tried to summarize the other approaches being taken. Um, and one of them is domain specific languages. Um, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more. We just didn't have familiar, familiar uh, staff that was experienced with those and didn't didn't want to write our own and went with C++. Um, one slide on this Cocos library, it's a, a C++ library which provides an abstraction layer around the code related to on-node parallelism, so loops and arrays. So we have a Cocos arrays and then a parallel for execution that will then run that for loop on CPUs, GPUs, and various GPUs. Um, and the Cocos is uh, very well supported. Right now, it's used by a lot of different applications within the with, within DOE at least. Um, and we've quickly been on been able to get on new GPUs. I have results from NVIDIA and AMD, and we have early results from Intel hard, hardware. Um, the downside of C++ is the code is definitely a lot more complicated from as compared to the Fortran. Um, so ob objectively, the domain scientists have a leg legitimate issue with the working with the code. Um, it may drive us to a model where, which is certainly what we're doing initially, where computer scientists, you know, work with domain scientists to write the code. The domain scientists write the algorithms and even maybe test them in Fortran and then the computer scientists port them. But we hope that won't long term will um, our uh, scientists will be able to work directly in the C++ code. Another advantage of rewriting a model from scratch is that um, we remove, you know, in some cases, decades of code that's been accumulated in these models for a long time. Uh, the last statement is most of the complexity you see in this particular example, and I'm not going to go into details, is, is due, due to this, the use of what we call PACs. That was our, um, we put that in in order to vectorize properly on CPUs. So C++, I don't quite understand well uh, why, but C++ codes generally do not vectorize very well automatically compared to Fortran. That's a strong suite of Fortran generating, you know, AVX vector type instructions. And to get competitive performance on CPUs, we need to put this in. If you don't, if you want to, you know, be 20, 30 percent slower or 50 percent slower on CPUs, go after only GPU performance, you can skip that part. And then just to mention, in addition to Cocos, we use another library called Yackle in the radiation package. Um, this is a smaller, kind of simplified version of Cocos, uh, but interesting because it's targeted at Fortran code, so it supports Fortran-like arrays, um, and it makes it a very uh, makes it simpler if you have a, if you're port, just porting a Fortran code to not have to 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 because the end result is minimal changes to your arrays and looks still looks very much in Fortran style. Uh, and then just to mention other efforts of uh, getting cloud resolving models running on GPUs, um, I have a probably incomplete summary here. Um, and NECAM I put because there are the most well-known and the world's first global cloud. They've been running global cloud resolving simulations um, for over a decade. They're actually 
I don't know if they're considering GPUs, but um, they're traditionally a Fortran code, and they're running on this large CPU-based you know, near exascale machine in Japan, Fugaku. So in some sense, that if they pursue that path, they don't have to port to GPUs. Um, and, and Max Planck in Europe, the ICON model, they're going with a Fortran open ACC approach. They have very good results on NVIDIA GPUs. Um, Europe is getting a big AMD machine, so we'll see, it'll be interesting to see how long it takes to get good results on that you know, different vendor with uh, a less open ACC support, but it's starting to be there. And then the uh, Allen Institute and the working with GFDL has a model called PACE. That's a DSL, so it's all written in Python and then um, converted into a, and so Python is the DSL and converted into a GPU and CPU code. The GT4, GT4, GT4 Pi package. UKMO, their upcoming Alfric model uses Cyclone. That's their uh, in-house DSL. It's a unique in that it's a Fortran. You write in, for, it's a DSL that you write in Fortran and then it converts it into GPU code. And then the Klima project, um, very interesting uh, because they're using Julia, that's a language designed for writing mathematical expressions. I really like Julia as a language, so it'd be great to see results there. Write it in Julia. Julia provides very sophisticated information about the dependencies, and then you can create a GPU backend out of that. Okay, then. So question on all this, um, what makes, uh, I mean, all these things are, if I were gonna, uh, dumb it down is a bunch of parallel arrays that have backends for whatever uh, runtimes that then map to the underlying hardware. Yeah. And so then, what makes a good a programming model good? Because I'm also thinking like uh, Google would be like Jax or NumPy or uh, a few of these uh, for Python. But is it like that? It these are Fortran like multi dimensional with, with slicing, or is it you want bigger objects that are not just numbers or yeah, maybe so not irregular computations? I think if you stick to that approach, which, which is just parallel four, then they're all reasonable and, it's, and it will come down to maturity because different approaches are have different levels of maturity. But I think that model will they should all eventually work equally well. The one thing we do with Cocos that's not often not supported in other models is hierarchical parallelism. So we don't do just parallel fours. Um, if you do just parallel fours, you have to push all your loops into every subroutine so that the loop in the subroutine contains the loop over all columns and all grid points and things like that. So we do, uh, which Cocos supports and GPU support, you, know, you launch teams of threads at a high level, all with a, a set of grid points. And then you go into your subroutines and you still have 128 threads left to parallelize the loops inside the subroutine over the vertical, in our case, 128 vertical levels. So that's, to me, the only minor difference between them is if you wanna go down the, road, the hierarchical parallelism route. And you, one thing you did not mention is uh, load balancing, job scheduling, like dynamic static, any of that stuff. Is that relevant? We do that in our uh, traditional model. We have a, inherited from CESM, so CESM has a nice night day for the physics, night day load balancing. That's the extent that we do where you, um, because the daytime has the radiation, which is very expensive. So we like each processor to have half their columns and daytime and half the columns in nighttime, so not geographically located. But we don't do anything sophisticated in the dynamics. And it's worthwhile to do that communication to scramble the data to get that night-day balance. At cloud resolving, we're not doing that, so we are we do have some load imbalance in the physics in the in the in the current screen implementation. Got it. Yeah, thank you. This is just, uh, uh, some people ask us how long it took. So this is a, a slide on that. I don't know if it's that interesting, but we did develop the Fortran 
and the C++ code simultaneously um, because the C++ code took a while before it was usable for doing anything. Um, so Fortran code to develop, to play around the physics configuration and develop the non-hydrostatic dynamical core. Um, and why we're doing that, the C++ code. It, we spent two years working with what I call prototyping, really the team learning to know, learning to what's going to work and what's not going to work. And then after that, it basically took us a year to port the, so here we're just porting Fortran code at this point, a year to port the non-hydrostatic model, a year to port the physics, another year for the glue code that hooks them all together. Um, and then just in 2023, um, we got the whole model running on this frontier system. And we have a nice paper I can send if people are interested on the, we were fortunate and then we got the model running right when the uh, Gordon Bell introduced this climate prize. So we were able to submit to that. Climate's not well represented in the, gen the general Gordon Bell, you know, fastest performance on the real application because we don't use these machines as efficiently as other applications, but there's this new category for the next 10 years just for climate models. Well, I have a question uh, uh, on the chat. Uh, what's the size of this team in this effort? Um, so, so E3SM as a whole, not the atmosphere team, is uh, 50 FTEs, about 100 people. This effort is probably, the, like the core people doing this work, I'd say it's three FTEs, maybe split over five people. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. In the DOE, we have this problem that people are often on multiple projects. And we have very few people 100% on one project, but they'll be on closely related projects. So it's, you, you know, I know if you had a dedicated team, I think it would go faster. Um, okay, so performance data. First, I'm gonna start with just the dynamical core where we looked at a very detailed single node performance. Um, and I, it's probably not detailed performance of why, but detailed comparison of different CPUs and different GPUs on a single node. Um, it's hard always to compare GPUs and CPUs, um, so I just like to uh, point this out. A GPU node uh, usually contains, in, in our case, four to six GPUs and a CPU. <laughs> so a GPU node, right, is in terms of TDP, about four, four to eight times more power than a CPU node. They also cost a lot more than a CPU node. I don't, it's hard to get those numbers, uh, hard to get the numbers that HPC centers actually pay for these GPU nodes. But I think it's also at least four times more expensive. Um, the power, that's TDP, right? The actual power, G, GPUs appear to be more efficient when not, when running our when not running our codes, they're usually not running the TDP. So it's hard to get this number also, but the power consumption might be closer to 3x. A GPU node is 3x. Uh, so when I compare CPUs and GPUs, there's, it's just difficult to, to do a truly fair comparison by power or by cost. Um, so I'm mostly going to compare GPU nodes versus CPU nodes. Um, but to start with, because we have a data going back about 10 years now, I'm going to compare a single GPU to a single dual socket CPU just for the dynamical core. And that's this data here. Um, I like this data just because it shows the trends over time. Uh, so this is performance of various GPUs and various CPUs going all the, all the way back to 2012. So this is kind of a, a mini app we use to benchmark performance. So it's our dynamical core, although it's our hydrostatic dynamical core, not our non-hydrostatic um, in a certain configuration. And the lowest curve on here is, uh, is the uh, Ivy Bridge, the, uh, one of the uh, Z, uh, Intel Xeon from 2012. And this, normal, this is kind of a normalized performance, High is, higher is better. And the CPUs and GPUs are you know, getting better in this metric. Um, every year. They are using, you know, the newer CPUs and the newer GPUs use a lot more power than the than the Ivy Bridge CPU. Um, our best results here at the top, the green is a 
is actually a CPU. That's the app, this uh, so dual socket AMD Epic node, 128 cores. And then this number here is a uh, A100, NVIDIA A100 GPU. The x-axis is the work, so it's sort of like scalability. It's the number of, in our case, spectral elements, or you can think of it as grid points, being assigned the GPU or the CPU node. So there's a uh, dependency. Your GPUs do best when there's a lot of work or a lot of grid points because they have so many more lightweight cores. Um, but the so from what we can tell, CPUs and GPUs are both continuing to get better. To, to go back to your question originally about you know is GPUs the future? I I wish I knew if CPUs were going to stagnate and GPUs were going to keep getting faster or vice vice versa. <laughs> um, and then just a comment, we have this pink line here. This is the A64X FX node that's in Fugaku. Um, that looks quite slow, um, but most of these are 400 to 600, 700 watts. That one is only is like 200 watts. So this particular metric is rather unfair to that uh, chip. And those nodes actually only have one A64FX, where all the other CPU nodes have two. OK, so turning to the, the full model, um, and this is now, that, so that was DICOR. This is DICOR in physics. Actually, oh. before you get to that, the sure. last thing was actually very interesting, because that means you can put many more of those cores, uh, of, of those uh, nodes, inside the same uh, you know, building yeah. uh, for the same power. Yeah. So, it, but is that right? Or the, at the MPI level, you run out of parallelism and doesn't make a difference? So in a traditional model, we definitely run out of parallelism, but in a cloud resolving model, you won't run out of parallelism. So it's it's actually a, uh, and that was the idea behind this green destiny. I had this slide from this project from 2009, millions of uh, low power chips. Uh, it hasn't, um, I don't think that's, I think that's still an idea at this stage, it hasn't been proven the results of, from Fugaku. I, I haven't seen actually a really good results from Fugaku yet. Thank but you. I, think, well, I think it's a good, I, I think it's a viable approach. Cool, and Michael, you had a question? Uh, yes, uh, so what about the uh, top level um, parallel loop, shall we say? Is it synchronous like in old style MPI or it's asynchronous? In the, is this referring to the hierarchical parallelism example? Uh, to the overall, uh, uh, basically to the benchmarks that you're showing. Yeah, oh, oh right. So the, the highest level loop here would be over the spectral elements. Mm -hmm. In the spectral element, and this is a property of finite element methods that's nice, every spectral element, the calculations are all completely independent. So that loop has no, you know, it's perfectly the loop over elements is perfectly parallelizable. And then once all they once they've completed all their calculations, mm -hmm. then there's this mass matrix inverse step that involves all the communication. Uh, uh, what about between machine, between the nodes? So this um, this benchmark is single node, but it is using MPI. Um, we usually benchmark both sometimes sometimes we even have both curves up. MPI between the cores, it's single. It's always single node or single GPU. So GPU, no MPI, but the CPU results are MPI or threads, whichever is fastest. Uh, I guess my question is that MPI traditionally run in synchronous mode, but it also allows asynchronous execution. So do you use synchronous oh. lockstep or asynchronous? I don't know. So what I do know, I'll, the, we don't do a lot there. We do, you know, a little, a few standard things like we post all our receives ahead of time, try and do some work when possible. Mm -hmm. Post receives, try and do as much as work as possible, and then do the weights on the. Huh. So it's asynchronous essentially. Okay, thank you. But we don't get. I don't. I don't believe we get much asynchronous work done uh, because it usually, you usually, you still spend most of your time waiting. There's not a lot of work we can do. Mm -hmm while the messages are in flight. And I don't even know if M modern MPIs do a lot of, can make progress asynchronously. Uh, but yeah, that's, sorry, I don't know much. Don't really know that. 
Okay, thanks. Sorry, I'm just gonna. Um, so this next one is low res, not the cl cloud resolving model, but this is uh, just to show. So here we run low res, the, um, sort of the point that was made before. Now we run out of parallelism at this resolution. Um, so we're running the 100 kilometer model um, up to about, so we start to run out of parallelism around 100 nodes. Um, and so this just to, shows first our Fortran, so this is our performance portability slide. And the first thing I'll show is the C++ versus Fortran. So the this is this here is the, the bottom curve is a black and blue. This is a not a very good CPU, the IBM P9, um, comparing Fortran and C++. So they're basically identical on this curve. One one of our a rather slow CPU, um, just uh, an old CPU, but it's still around in this machine uh, summit. And then this. The next curves here, black and blue, are on a uh, Epic. So this is one of our fastest CPUs uh, we we have access to, dual socket, 64 cores per socket Epic. And here's the C++ code in blue, slightly faster than the Fortran code. And that's probably because Fortran we rely and the compiler to do all the vectorization, and the C++ we've tediously vector, you know, hand forced vectorization in every loop possible. And then the red are the GPU results. Um, and there's three different GPUs demonstrating the, a little bit of performance portability because we're getting good results on both NVIDIA, which use CUDA behind the scenes, and AMD GPUs, which use a uh, HIP underneath the hood to, to run. And the fastest one is the, <clears throat> the A100, the circles here. And so, um, this is again a node to node comparison. So it doesn't, you know, GPUs are, there's a region, a regime um, where GPUs, a GPU node is significantly faster than a CPU node. Um, and four to 10 times faster in, in, in this regime. Um, so, uh, you know, if you say GPUs, can, GPU node, nodes consume three to four times more power, we are looking at a, you know, better performance per watt. And then this is data on, so um, that was comparing Fortran and, and different uh, GPUs here. Now we're only running our Fortran code um, on two big machines, the three machines, Perlmutter, Summon, and Frontier. It's too many curves here because um, each, each, each benchmark has three numbers, the die core, which contains all the MPI communication, the full, the atmosphere model, and then the full model, because we still have, we have to spend a lot of time talking to the other components that are running on the CPU. Um, so I don't want to go, I have a simple one next, um, uh, but I just wanted to show here, we get the same benefit as the Perlmutter CPU node. So this is AMD Epic, which is our a fastest CPU system we have access to. And then the GPU nodes, both uh, four MI250s or six V100s um, give you a nice speed up over a CPU node. And then just extracting some curves out of that. Um, I'll focus not on the, well, I'll start with the, just the atmosphere. So that's, you know, the piece where we really focused on running on the GPUs at cloud, this is now cloud resolving, resolution. This is our configuration we use for these diamond model inner comparisons and for our longer simulations. Um, and we've, uh, this is scaling. This is, the thin line is perfect scaling. So we get decent scaling. It does start to roll off at on 8,000 nodes. It's 32,000 GPUs. Um, so there is a, you know, we, we were talking about limits previously. Um, go to one kilometer, then you're looking at, you know, basically unlimited 300,000. You could probably scale to hundreds of thousands of nodes. And then so our, we make a big deal. This is kind of a psychological benchmark or threshold to ex exceed one year per day at, for a cloud resolving model, uh, which we, our atmosphere is running at one year per day. We, unfortunately, the full model, the coupling to these data components providing surface conditions, um, 
got us down to below one year a day for the for the full model. So that's this is Frontier. So this is a um, our first runs on an exascale computer and getting to one year per day. All right, this is my last slide. This is uh, just a comment on the machine learning. I'm, I'm actually not involved in any machine learner, learning work, um, but I think it's very exciting and uh, a lot of interest in the community. And it's somehow all tied to global cloud resolving models um, and this popular digital twin concept. So I think, uh, you know, it's a lot of work to have a, or, or interest around having a digital twin of the earth. And I think the global cloud resolving model, uh, they're, they have the realism to, to serve that role, but they're so expensive. I think a digital twin needs to be much more affordable uh, to explore that. Um, and there's a lot of approaches. I think there's no uh, slam dunks right now. No, we don't know what's going to, uh, uh, where the big successes are. Um, but just to mention, uh, you know, this work training machine learning models on purely observations, so you wouldn't even need a model to re basically replace models based on based just on observations. Um, train a machine learning model to replace the GCRM. The approach I like is to train a machine learning model to do bias correction. So you have a low res model and then a high res model and you machine learn the difference so that you can bias correct the low res model. Um, and then a lot of work, still a lot of uncertainty in these parameterizations. So a lot of work, can you get better parameterizations through machine learning? And I'll stop here, thanks. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Are there uh, any questions on the call? Okay, so one, I'm just, oh yeah, let's first Michael. Um, uh, thank you. So I, I, I do have a, you know, like a question, a more philosophical one. So you had this choice either to uh, keep the source code in Fortran and uh, spend your effort to maybe push the, uh, the for trans vendors to support all the fancy new architectures or like a uh, solo the bulletin and uh, port the original code to something that already has support. Yep. So could you uh, tell more about this choice that you made and you apparently gave up on the on pushing the vendors? Right, We so we, it's our, key computational mission is to run on these machines and we really wanted to run you know the day they were turned on we wanted to be up and running mm -hmm. and we really felt c++ was the only way to get to that level of readiness on these architectures and we have we have to support two uh amd and intel the intel gpus later on this year and the intel gpus do not support open acc um, so even so, OpenACC wasn't. You, you would have to have OpenMP working if you're going to run on Intel GPU. So for us, it was really, it's a key part of our mission, and we wanted to be ready right away. Is it to me the main motivation? I think the I, I, some people say Fortran is dying. I, I don't believe that. I think Fortran and OpenACC is a or OpenMP will eventually be mature enough for these codes. Another argument, just to uh, we, I, I don't know if this is true, but another argument made is it's it's much easier to hire C plus plus programmers than performance, uh, than Fortran programmers. Um, mm -hmm. I don't generally think I think people interested in the app in this application and and HPC don't really care too much about the language. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, you know, pro professional software engineers definitely C plus plus is easier than Fortran hiring. Yeah, well, if I I were to write some uh, high performance, I would not choose C plus plus. Of course, it's just such a curse. Yeah. Uh, so the main specific language is well, what you were saying. So uh, having Fortran as that domain specific language would be of course desirable. Yeah. It's a, for our application, it's such a nice language. 
I agree. And so there's a, so one thing you haven't, uh, I'd like to hear more about is uh, adaptivity. So uh, to what extent is it useful or challenging to use adaptive meshes? And also there's a, a flip side of adaptively low balancing and using the hardware given the changing now conditions in the algorithm. Yeah, there's been, so there's a lot of good research on that in the community and I, I'm not that, so the comment I'll make is it hasn't made it into the, uh, the kind of production models. Um, adaptivity is challenging because um, convection is the want to adapt to resolve, you know, instead of doing cloud resolving, uh, resolve convection, resolve the cells where you're going to get convection. But you often need high resolution to know if you're going to have convection. So you need to, the work I've seen, you do a little pre refinement to see if you need to refine more. So it just becomes challenging to do that. Um, but I think it's a good, uh, you know, a good area to pursue. And then the, I think the hard part about kind of adaptive domain decomposition is that the, the time steps are so, you know, we really, I forget the numbers, but it's milliseconds per time step. Um, there's just so little work especially because we're always scaled out for each time step for the communication that to move things around is going to swap, swamp all your, any potential gains. Um, even on the GPUs, right? If you leave a little bit of code on the CPU, it just ruins all your performance. The, the, we can copy back and forth at the time step level to couple with the other components, but it, it, we can't afford to copy back and forth the entire time step has to be resident on the GPU. We can't afford a single copy in that time step. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, and then uh, you, you you talked about uh, machine learning and that kind of stuff, but maybe more computationally, uh, a lot of the stuff, uh, the wider workflow within which the stuff works has to be like you need to do uh, uncertain quantification, run the thing many times. It's hardly expensive. Uh, yeah. You may even to create a data set for training data set for machine learning model. You have to run it many times to pick yeah. the right parameters for a lot of these. You know, I don't care what the ML algorithm is, you have to run it a lot of times. Yeah. Uh, so, how does that? you know, data-driven or many samples kind of workflow fit into the very expensive simulations we're talking about? Yeah, no, good question. <laughs> I I don't want to, I'm not even going to venture a guess. I, I just don't know. I, I think that's a key challenge. Um, you know, we were, the only thing I can say is the, you know, cloud res the cloud resolving modeling on these new machines will be that much easier and that much faster and we can afford that much more simulation than we could before so that um that makes sense so then let me ask a flip side uh is it how feasible or useful is it to do regional models on i'm not going to say real or fake earths uh because you have a small thing on whatever scenarios you can actually have a very diverse training set of what physics looks like yeah or any of these models or parameterizations so i think you can do a lot of uh, training you can certainly do a lot of training at cloud resolving resolution with regional models or in, in our case um, we're trying to replace regional models with refinement so you can run cloud resolving over a region of interest inside a global model um, and that makes it much more you know so it's, you're not getting cloud resolving everywhere but you can do a lot of process studies with that understand um, understand what cloud resolving models are doing right and improve them and or understand processes at a more fundamental level that will go in that will inform parameterizations for other models or, or things like that or train a machine learn model region by region and then put it in the global model i'm just speculating yeah, there, that makes a lot of sense yeah that's no, really good yeah thank you very much it was fantastic again yeah, thank you for coming have a great day all right thank you Thanks right. for your attention. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.